For socially anxious children like Pam, Chris, James, and Barbara, there was no diagnosis and no treatment. Constant anxiety caused them to develop other disorders like depression. And the way to deal with acute shyness, they were told, was to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Get over it, snap out of it. I don't think that really works, but that's our attitude toward people with mental health problems, behavioral problems, and emotional problems. So that I think that people tend to think, well, this is just the way I am, and I'm gonna get laughed at if I try to get help for it. I went to visit my friend in Western New York, and she had one TV channel on her TV. And all of a sudden, this commercial came on for a social anxiety series of tapes that was supposed to help you get past this social anxiety. And they started listing the symptoms. Yeah, I said, oh my god, that's me. That's me on that tape. I started to cry, because <laughs> it just, there was a name for it. <laughs> So many years. <laughs> there was a name for it, and something existed. And it looked like I could get help. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Social anxiety disorder was misunderstood for years until 1985 when Dr. Michael Leibowitz published a paper about its devastating effects. Dr. Leibowitz started the first anxiety disorders clinic in the United States. In the last 15 years, we've recognized the disorder. We've described it. We understand something about the biology, a lot about how common it is in the population. Uh, we can really help most of the people affected by it to a significant degree. At the New York State Psychiatric Institute, a research team is looking into the brain in a whole new way. Utilizing PET scan imaging, they search for the answer to a puzzling question. How do the neurotransmitters dopamine and serotonin affect patients with social anxiety disorder? Neurotransmitters are chemicals that help pass a nerve signal from one neuron to the next. How do they affect us? Well, when you wake up in the morning, it's because certain nerves are flooding your brain with the neurotransmitter serotonin. Or when you're exercising, your nerve endings release dopamine, a neurotransmitter that helps muscles move more easily. Neurotransmitters affect everything we do, every thought we have, and they have a great influence on our sense of well-being. Think of a neurotransmitter as an electronic messenger that passes a nerve signal from one neuron to the next throughout the entire body. In order to do its job, it has to move through a small gap between neurons called the synapse and get absorbed by the next neuron. But sometimes, for reasons scientists don't yet understand, that doesn't happen. And when it doesn't, people experience a myriad of problems, including the effects of social anxiety disorder. The reason that really I'm focusing now on serotonin is due to the success of the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and those are drugs which are all currently being used in the treatment of social phobia. Dr. Kent uses PET scan images in the hope that she can see how the group of antidepressant medications, known as the SSRIs, help neurons absorb serotonin. She starts by doing a baseline PET scan on patients prior to treatment with the SSRI drug paroxetine. In the second column here, we see the baseline PET scan, or the first PET scan that was done before treatment was instituted. And the hot areas, or the brightest areas here, are the areas of the greatest binding, or greatest density of the serotonin transporter. After three to six months of treatment with paroxetine, on rescanning these patients, these images show a significant reduction in hot, hot spots or brightness, indicating that those sites now are occupied by the drug, paroxetine. It does suggest that, at least with this drug, that there is very, very high occupancy of those brain sites. And so you can really see the mechanism of action of how this drug is working in the brain. 
all the patients really were feeling significantly better and actually functioning better in their social lives and uh, really overall um, much, much, much less anxious. Social anxiety disorder shows some difference in symptoms around the world. Dr. Roberto Luis Fernandez studies the impact of social anxiety disorder on different cultural groups. And he's found some surprising distinctions. In some Asian groups, for example, the concern is much more about the impact of your symptoms on somebody else, how they feel embarrassed or uncomfortable by you. Whereas here in the United States, it's often about feeling embarrassed yourself. Cultural differences influence how we view social anxiety disorder. They also influence what triggers it. In U.S. Latinos or Latin Americans in general, dancing is very important. And a lot of people I see come in because they're concerned about feeling embarrassed about the way they dance in front of other people. For new immigrants, social anxiety can be triggered as a reaction to a foreign environment. People who migrate um, might have been in their countries of origin somewhat shy, but not to the degree where it would have caused a problem. But after migration, they might feel much more difficulty in social interactions because they have to deal with following a new set of social rules, which they may not completely know about or feel comfortable with. Whereas if they had uh, not been in that migrant situation, they may never have had social phobia to that degree or even have received the diagnosis. There are two kinds of treatment that have been proven by good, rigorous scientific studies to be effective. One is a type of psychotherapy called cognitive behavioral psychotherapy, and the other are medications, particularly medications that we usually call antidepressant medications, although we now know that they're useful for anxiety as well. The medications maybe have a little bit of edge in terms of how potent they are, but the cognitive therapy looks more durable in terms of its effects after you stop. Um, so there may be ways to combine the two to really get the best of both worlds. Medication and psychotherapy are intended to change the person, and the person is part biology, part psychology. Dr. Richard Heinberg, director of the Adult Anxiety Disorder Clinic at Temple University, uses cognitive behavioral therapy with socially anxious adults. In this form of therapy, patients learn to change the way they feel by changing the way they think. She won't go out with me. She'll have changed her mind by the time I call her. Mm -hmm. Okay, Those very, very negative predictions. Right. And the outcome in truth was <laughs> she went out with me. <laughs> Pretty amazing how different those things can be, isn't it? And this therapy assumes that part of the anxiety response in adults affected by this disorder is a learned behavior. Yeah, um, and like many other learned behaviors, it can be modified through training. A very important piece of cognitive behavior therapy is not only talking about situations, but actually doing and learning by doing. Is she somebody that you would like to call again? Definitely. OK. Well, how about we set that up okay. as our, an agreement between us that, that's, that you'll call her this week? Sometime <laughs> in the next day or two, in fact, let's say, because you don't want too much time to pay. <laughs> Okay, I guess. Uh, Will you agree to do it? Yeah, I'll, I'll try. Will you agree to do it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Over time, patients learn to replace yeah. their negative, anxious response to social situations with a more appropriate one. The first step in getting better is often the hardest, finding the courage to ask for help. At least now I, 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 want, I want to do do these things, you know, to, to reduce the anxiety. Absolutely. I think you're on the road to recovery, you know. Not only that, but just coming here yeah. and doing what you're doing is very courageous. <laughs> and desperation. <laughs> uh, you could call it desperation. Yeah. Um, what do you feel better, calling it desperation or courage? What's going to make you feel better? They're both correct. <laughs> well. Well, I guess whatever people want to call it. Yeah, what it do you feels, to me, it feels desperate, though. It it's, feels desperate. Yeah. But if you said it courageous, say courageous. 
Courageous. Say desperate. Desperate. Which feels better? Well, Not which feels more real, what feels better? Um, courageous feels better for me. It's a better thing, you know. It's so, uh, that okay. feels, you know, but, um, but it feels desperate. Yeah. Where you need to go in your thinking is to start balancing that negative thinking that it's desperate yeah. to one of courageous. They're both correct. Yeah. But the other way is going to oh. make you happier. I see. I never thought of it that way before, that they're both correct. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, to me, it just seemed desperate, and that was it. Right. Uh, well, think about it as courageous. OK. OK? Just two months after beginning cognitive behavioral therapy, James starts seeing results. Today, I'm going to, the, to a grocery store because um, that is something that has been hard for me to do in the past. I feel I have made some progress, you know, in dealing with social phobia. Just on, like, trying to face the things I used to avoid before. I've been using a lot of techniques on, that, that I learned from the therapist. I'm seeing a Dr. Caden. One of the ones that helps me a lot is just to um, remind myself, you know, even if I do feel anxious and, um, you know, it, it, even if it is noticed by other people or that it's, it's not the end of the world and, you know, I just think, so what, you know, even if they do see that, you know, about me. Is that a no, it's cash. Thanks. You too. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I'm learning that about a lot of things lately. <laughs> you know, nothing is as bad as it seems it could be. Another way James copes with his anxiety is by using a talent he's had for years, turning his experiences with social anxiety into cartoons. I guess it's like with, with um, writing, they say, write what you know, and it's like, this is something I knew what it was like to go through, so I might as well do cartoons on, on that, you know. I can appreciate, you know, how awful a certain experience can be, but then find the humor in it and it put it into a cartoon. A couple of websites that also deal with this um, have put them up. I've gotten a lot of good feedback. It's good just to look at the bad experiences and, and you know, make funny cartoons out of them. And if other people can look at them and maybe laugh too, then all the better. many people there. Every time we go over After years of living with anxiety, Pam has also decided to fight the fear. It's been about four weeks, I'd say, since you guys were last here. And I've started taking a medication, continue to see the social worker who's helping me with cognitive therapy. And I've had some ups and downs.